You are listening to a TechSide Network podcast. TechSide.net. Casual conversation from technically passionate people. This is Americanitis, episode 18 for May 2nd, 2020. I'm your host, Daniel Sagner. This podcast contains harsh language and covers adult topics. You'll be challenged by views with which you do not agree. We may not be politically correct, but we are correct about politics. It's another corona sode, but of course it is. The lockdown is the most egregious affront to your human rights at the moment, and so it needs to be talked about. Let me put this up front. I am not a callous man. I am not uncaring, and I am not blind to suffering. I have a grandfather that will very likely die because of this virus. He is 95 years of age. He survived a Nazi death camp as a child, escaped to America, got drafted into World War II to get shipped right back to Germany to fight on the front lines, and he has one fucking lung. So yeah, you could say he's in the crosshairs. I'm sure that almost all of you have loved ones that are at risk and for whom you would do anything to protect. That's not what I'm talking about here. Protecting those you care for is one thing. The state locking you in your home is another. I've recently grown a little concerned, perplexed even, about the number of philosophically minded people I follow and in some cases look up to who are taking this lockdown on the chin. They accept it as a matter of course that the state had the right to force its citizens into house arrest, close businesses, put millions, really billions of lives on hold and in jeopardy. I keep hearing things like, we need a plan for reopening, or freeing the economy back up is essential, but it has to be done right. And this is from those same minds that produce exquisite defenses of freedom, of capitalism, of reason. But I cannot square it. Am I in the wrong? I have yet to hear a reasonable defense of why the state has such abilities, let alone if it was appropriate to use them. So let's walk through this, shall we? Maybe I'll come to some epiphany along the way. Let us first remind ourselves of the proper role of a government in a free society, to protect the rights and the lives of its citizens. Well, it seems we can stop right here, right? The state is performing its duty by protecting the lives of its citizens. Ah, but we drive two-ton boxes of steel all the time, and we eat hamburgers and go bungee jumping, so it seems that the state does not exist to protect us from ourselves, but rather from others. That makes more sense, but then don't we also, under normal circumstances, threaten each other by our mere presence? A year ago, before the coronavirus, I could give you the flu and you could die from it. So it also seems that there's a recognition that the world is a dangerous place and that other people are a risk just by interacting with you. Fair enough, it would be unreasonable for the state to continuously demand that everyone stay home because you might catch the flu. We have lives to lead, after all, and we can't lead those lives if we're stuck in our cells and can't breathe. The world is a dangerous place, but it's also filled with wonderful things. Well, everything changed with the coronavirus. Five times deadlier than the flu, by the current estimates, and highly contagious. 0.5% fatality, by the way. That's five times the flu. 0.5%. Half of 1% of our country's citizens very likely will die from this. It is very, very contagious. You may have already had it and didn't even know about it, because if you're under the age of 50, there's a good chance you were asymptomatic. This means that if you got the virus, you didn't know it, killed it, and moved on. That also means that you're likely now immune, but that is yet to be proven. Now, that's the state of things now. I know that's not what everyone knew going into this mess, but it doesn't actually matter. You see, the question I have here is not what should have been done, but rather what may the state do? The state is not some omniscient, omnipotent god. It's just a bunch of individuals carrying out the functions of government. These people are not special, they just have a profession that you did not choose. So what gives them the right to tell you 
that you may not open your store? Why can they lock us in our homes and arrest us for taking a walk? Where do they get off telling me that my job is not essential? Essential to whom? It is my estimation that we are being judged as sick until proven healthy. I claimed in my first cast on the subject that the state has the responsibility of performing quarantine by force, and that is true. Quarantine, however, is for the sick. If it is the nature of this virus that I may infect others without even showing symptoms, then so be it. But that does not then translate into me losing my autonomy. So when I hear my fellows saying that the state needs a plan, when I hear them bandying about the numbers of tests required and how long until a vaccine, when I hear them saying things like herd immunity and voluntary social distancing measures and we can't just wait for a vaccine, I can't help but listen to that little itch in the back of my mind that tells me that some bigger point is being missed. Do they think that this is okay? Do they think that this is acceptable? Are they afraid to say it? Well, then I'll say it for them, then. The government should not have locked down a damn thing as they had no right to do so. They have the ability, sure, they have the guns, but they do not have the right. Let's say, for an example, I purchase a plot of land, and on it, I build a barbershop. I trade with others to build the structure, to paint it, and to bring in the equipment necessary for such a venture. I contract with some locals who have a penchant for cutting of hair, and I set my prices, do my marketing, and open my doors. My patrons trust me, and choose me over the competition. <laughs> maybe it's my sparkling demeanor, my engaging conversation, or maybe it's the fact that I demanded the best barbers and I pay them well for it. Then, the state declares that it has emergency powers and tells me to shutter my business on my land, fire my employees, and turn away my customers. That anyone trading with me to get a haircut is in violation and will be fined or thrown in prison. What crime was committed? What charge is leveled? Upon whose rights did I infringe by trading with my neighbors? The crime, apparently, of being too close to each other. Don't you know? There's a pandemic. We're all scared and panicky. The only thing that we know is that we know nothing and that's enough to go on. We cannot trust our fellow man to handle his own life, make his own decisions, or be rational. So we need to lock him up until this is all over. By what right? This is the mixed economy in all of its horror. This is altruism. This is the distrust of reason. This is, consequently, the worst possible thing that the state could have done. Instead of allowing individuals to unleash the power of their minds and fix these problems, they flipped a switch and ground the very lifeblood of this country to a screeching halt. They call it a necessary sacrifice. Well, I don't believe in sacrifice. I don't fucking buy it anyway. When you sacrifice, you lose. You give up something of high value for something of lesser value. In this case, you're asked to give up your soul. Oh, but just a piece of it. Just the part that revels in your productive capacity and your inventiveness and you're seeing people face to face. You're asked to give up time, which is the most precious resource you have. And of course, you're asked to give up your livelihood. And for what? So that... Hospitals that have had their hands tied behind their backs by regulations have time to prepare? Well, whose fault is that? Maybe the fact that hospitals need to ask the state pretty please before they can expand may suggest a cause for the shortage of beds. Does this sound like a deal to you? Or does it make you question why we ever had such restrictions in the first place, and what the world may look like if the dumbasses with the guns had stayed out of the way? So let's talk about the effects of this unprecedented use of force for a minute. What has the state accomplished for all of its posturing, browbeating, check-cutting, and nanny policing? Neighbor spying on neighbor is great. That's just super and doesn't smell like totalitarianism at all. I was glad to see that New York State's greatest clown de Blasio snitches hotline was spammed with dick pics and Nazi references. Never been more proud to be an American. Some people don't need a fancy phone app, though. They just call the police when they see their fellows enjoying themselves outside or driving in the countryside. But let's put aside the busybodies. I've spoken of them before. Go back and listen to Horny for Fascism, episode 15. Let's talk about the hospitals we were supposedly saving from a crushing wave of sick and dying. Between entertaining yourself by watching supposedly work-to-death nurses perform dances on TikTok videos, you might read about the hospital closures happening all over the country. But why? There's so much demand. 
Well, in the case of Decatur County General, when they were slated to close their doors, there were a grand total of zero coronavirus patients in the area. According to the National Rural Health Association, the loss of revenue over the last few weeks due to the inability to provide non-emergency care is destabilizing core health services in rural America. Let's be clear. It's not that they are not able to provide these services, is that they are not allowed. The state banned non-urgent procedures across the board. From Oregon, we hear the following, quote, COVID-19 has been a catastrophe for some hospitals, medical clinics, and other health care providers. Some hospitals were virtually emptied of paying customers when elective surgeries were banned, unquote. So the state says you can't have your knee surgery. Big deal, right? Wrong. This is an affront to quality of life. Not only are you stuck at home, unable to live your life in a meaningful way, but you are actively prevented from getting a procedure that allows you to enjoy your life fully. You may be in serious pain, but there's a government thug who says that you have no right to trade with someone who can provide you with care. Do you know what else is not urgent? Cancer screenings. I don't have to tell you why that's a problem. Talk to any insurance provider and they will tell you. They focus on preventative care. They don't want you sick. It costs them money. They want available to you a reasonable chance that you will catch cancers or other serious health issues early. And they want doctors empowered to steer you in a better direction. You get a better life. The doctors and insurance companies make money. Win-win. Now that this is no longer possible, the clock is reset. All that preventative care that could have avoided people getting ill is gone. How many will die because of a mole that should have been diagnosed? How many will live the remainder of their lives in a little more pain? How many will be put in nursing homes a little earlier because they just can't get around like they used to? State intervention into the economy has real consequences for real people. I was also going to bring up the absolute calamity that is the economic distortions introduced here, but they are myriad and multitudinous. It would take a month of Sundays to unravel even a fraction of the impact the state has had here. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. The state did this. The virus didn't do a damn thing. The virus can make you ill. It might even kill you. But it cannot rain destruction on this scale. It cannot force 30 million Americans out of work. Only the state can do that. And if that's not enough bad news about the state fucking things up royally, just wait until you hear the stories of farmers dumping milk, throwing out eggs, and plowing under perfectly good food because their market has dried up. Meatpacking facilities are closing and produce suppliers are going bankrupt. The Wall Street Journal writes about this story under the headline, quote, Coronavirus forces farmers to destroy their crops, unquote. But did it really? Did the coronavirus get a gun and come to the farmer's house and force them? Did the virus find a way to infect produce and chickens and cows? No. It was the state that did this. Put the blame where it belongs and don't let them hide behind a germ. Politicians have one goal. They want to get reelected. Seen through this lens, the state's reaction to the pandemic starts to make sense, doesn't it? First, the Chinese government tries to hide it. If it's not a problem, no one knows. Then, when the problem is realized, they try to ignore it. Don't talk about it, and maybe it'll blow over. And finally, when the truth is obvious to everyone, it's too late for half measures. You can't be the one that didn't take it seriously. You'll be roasted on a pyre. You need to overreact now. That's how you get global lockdowns. Everyone's worried about public opinion. This is why it is important that we think in principles, and this is why we need an educated populace with a basic understanding of the philosophy of this country and whence their rights come. They need to understand the limitations placed upon the government and why they are necessary. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The Constitution is only so much paper unless it is understood by the people. As I said, politicians only want to get re-elected, and this means they'll do whatever the people want and demand. Strong checks and balances are not enough. Philosophical rot will, over time, corrupt any institution, no matter the quality of its foundation. The state had no right to shut down a single business, not one. The least that can be done now is to lessen the damage and apologize to the American people for handling this like a bunch of scared children. I say open the floodgates. They never should have been closed. Hey, it's time for the quote of the week. Today, a quote from Seneca. Quote, 
You live as if you were destined to live forever. No thought of your frailty ever enters your head. Of how much time has already gone by, you take no heed. You squander time as if you drew from a full and abundant supply. Though all the while, that day which you bestow on some person or thing is perhaps your last." Unquote. Here, Seneca reminds us that our time is our most precious resource. We only have so much, and we don't know how much we have. Therefore, it is right to exert ourselves in the pursuit of our values and in the direction of our purpose every day. Waste not an hour. Do not waste a minute of your life on something that you hate but think you must do. All your actions should be pointed at the same ultimate goal. Eudaimonia. A happy, well-lived life. The astute listener will realize why I chose this quote. It contrasts rather well with the argument I made earlier. The state is demanding your time, but won't tell you how much. It's telling you to spend it in a certain way, in a way that makes it nearly impossible to pursue your values. This is unconscionable. It is unthinkable. It is evil. It should be fought with every fiber of your being. Get a topic or feedback, or reach out on Twitter. The podcast is at American Itis Tech. That's the at sign, American I T I S T E K. You can also follow me at Dan Sagner. My last name is spelled Sierra Alpha Golf November Echo Romeo. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, a podcast of your thing. I'm also on YouTube, so remember to subscribe there. Patronize us at patreon.com slash techside. Show notes are at techside.net slash American Itis. Theme music by Eddie. I thank you all for listening. Later days. Thank you.